This video is supported by The Great Courses Plus. Last September, basically a year ago, Elon Musk announced his plans for SpaceX to go to Mars. It was a huge deal, headlines everywhere. Some lowly YouTubers may have covered it. Since then, other private companies like Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin have gotten into the space game, and some international agencies have had some victories as well. But there is one group that also has their eyes on Mars that hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention lately. They're called NASA. Remember them? When NASA landed on the moon in 1969, for a brief moment, it felt like anything was possible. There were talks of us getting to the moon by the 1980s, to Saturn by the 1990s, and Alpha Centauri by the year 2000. And yeah, that sounds crazy now, but keep in mind, back then, they had just gotten from couldn't get off the ground to landing on the moon in less than 10 years. And we also just beat the Russians, which was the whole point, if we're gonna be honest here. But flash forward to today, not only are we not on Mars or on the moon, we don't even have a manned spaceship we can use right now. American astronauts have to fly on Russian spaceships to get to the International Space Station, so yeah. Who won? This gap has opened up an opportunity for private companies like SpaceX to jump in and do cargo missions to the ISS, and they've made some pretty amazing advancements in the last 10 years. Actual reusable rockets that land back on the launch pad. I mean, we've gotten used to seeing it at this point, but let's face it, that is a miracle of modern science. And it's actually living up to the promise of the space shuttle, which never really quite lived up to that promise. Amy from Vintage Space does a great video about it here. But Elon Musk's original plan for SpaceX was to make human beings a multiplanetary species. Mars was the goal from day one, and it was through that singular vision that SpaceX became the company it is today. NASA, on the other hand, is a government agency, and they're subject to the winds of political change and national budgets, and there have been multiple presidents of both parties that have made big pushes for Mars and then never really funded them. By the way, one major difference between SpaceX and NASA is their method of manufacture. NASA's manufacturing process is spread throughout the United States because spending money in as many states as possible is the best way to get those Congress people to vote for extra funding. For instance, a senator in Louisiana is a lot more likely to vote for funding for NASA if he knows that that funding is going to be spent in Louisiana and creating jobs there. But this, of course, creates a giant behemoth that's difficult to maintain and very costly. SpaceX, by comparison, limits the number of places that they manufacture to as few as possible to cut down on costs. This is obviously a plus for private enterprise, but some argue that that's only good for cheap, low-Earth orbit resupply missions. For the big interplanetary projects, you need the kind of massive budgets that only NASA has access to. And really, this is where NASA has the upper hand, because while their manned program may have been kicked back to square one, their interplanetary program has been blowing our minds for over 40 years. From the recent Juno mission to Jupiter to the New Horizons mission that went past Pluto, all the way back to the Voyager mission 40 years ago, which was the first man-made object that ever actually left the solar system, NASA knows how to get around. So we find ourselves in an interesting situation. Two organizations, one old, big, and experienced, the other young, nimble, and ambitious, both with new launch vehicles coming out in the next few years, and both of them with their eyes on Mars. So let's compare their plans, their vehicles, and their timelines and see which one wins out, starting with SpaceX. The SpaceX ship is the ITS, the Interplanetary Transport System, which is made up of three parts, the Interplanetary Spaceship, the Super Heavy Lift Launch Vehicle, and the ITS Tanker. The Interplanetary Spaceship will be 49.5 meters long and 12 meters wide, made out of carbon fiber hull and powered by nine Raptor engines fueled by a mix of densified methane and oxygen propellants. Now, Elon has always had colonization in mind, so this ship was designed to carry up to 100 people, although early flights will obviously have far fewer than that. But he said that they would have zero gravity games, restaurants, movie theaters, basically making it more like a cruise ship experience. The ship will be powered by two large solar panels that will produce up to 200 kilowatts of power, although that amount will go down the further it gets away from the sun. And Elon said he wants to name the inaugural ship the Heart of Gold after the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The Super Heavy Lift Launcher is a monster of a launch vehicle with 42 Raptor engines producing more than 28 million pounds of thrust. It's reusable and designed to return to the launch pad and land just like the Falcon that we've come to know and love. It would be far and away the largest launch vehicle ever constructed. And finally, the ITS tanker uses the same hull as the interplanetary spaceship to carry fuel to the spaceship in orbit. So, the way it works is the interplanetary spaceship would take off on top of the Super Heavy lift launch vehicle. Once in space, the Super Heavy turns around and heads back to Earth, where it lands to great applause and gets fitted with the tanker. It then relaunches with the tanker on board, and the tanker and the spaceship do a little dance and make sweet, sweet love. I mean, fills the spaceship.
But I mean, come on. Come on. Quick note, while the SpaceX video only shows them docking once, it's been estimated that it would probably take up to five launches to fully load up the ITS. Once fueled up, the tanker returns to Earth and the spaceship takes off toward Mars, unfurls its solar panels, and begins its 80 to 150 day journey. When it gets to Mars, it burns through the Martian atmosphere, lands upright, after which the doors open and the people run out screaming as fast as possible. Cause they've been stuck in a tin can with these people for the last five months. And that guy, Doug, he's got, he's, Doug has problems. The biggest criticism Elon has faced with this whole plan is his timeline, which is ambitious to say the least. The plan was to start by sending an unmanned Red Dragon capsule to Mars, which is a modified version of the Dragon 2, using the Falcon Heavy in 2018 and 2020, while they develop and test the ITS, and then send the ITS to Mars unmanned in 2022, and finally send the first manned mission to Mars in 2024. Now, if that sounds ridiculous to you, that's because it's September 2017, and they still haven't even tested the Falcon Heavy, or the Dragon 2. And apparently that sounded ridiculous to Elon Musk as well because he recently pushed the first launch back to 2020. How that will affect the rest of the timeline, we'll see. By the way, it's worth taking a moment to talk about the Dragon 2 because this is a really important step for SpaceX because despite all their successes, they've never put a person in orbit. But the Dragon 2's time is coming. With an unmanned test run to dock with the ISS in February of 2018, followed by the first manned mission in June of 2018. They also plan to start lunar tourism missions in 2019 with two unnamed billionaires already signed up to take an around the moon trip that's fully automated. In fact, there was sort of a weird game of one-upsmanship back in February when NASA announced that they might try to do the same thing in 2019 on board the Orion spacecraft, which we'll get to here in a minute. Now, everything I just told you was from the announcement last year, and there have been some significant changes along the way that I should talk about. First of all, the Dragon 2 originally was gonna land on legs, much like the Falcon does now, but SpaceX has decided to instead go with a splashdown. Apparently, the singeing element of the spacecraft coming through the planet, as well as the rockets going down, didn't do very good things for the legs. Now, this changes their plans to use the Red Dragon to land on Mars, because there's no water to splash down onto at Mars, so the Red Dragon is no more. I will remember you. Also, it looks like the diameter of the ITS has gone from 12 meters down to 9 meters. The reason given is that at 9 meters, SpaceX could use their existing facilities to build this vehicle instead of having to build a new assembly plant. It also means they could rent space at NASA's assembly plant in Louisiana, and it gives them more flexibility to do commercial and military projects with the ITS. Now this is actually really important because the big flaw in SpaceX's plan was that there wasn't really any commercial value to the Mars missions. Even if they're charging $200,000 a ticket, that's not gonna get anywhere near the tens of billions of dollars that it's gonna cost to develop this machine. Which for a private company is a pretty big hurdle to get over, but being able to get extra commercial and military contracts would probably help make up the difference. Now the smaller diameter means they probably won't be able to get all 42 of the Raptor engines on there, so it's probably gonna go down to something more like 21 engines. Fewer engines means it's not gonna have as much power, which means it's not gonna be able to get as much weight up in space. Now how this changes their Mars plans is yet to be seen. But actually Elon is gonna be speaking at the International Astronautical Conference in Australia later this month, where he's gonna address some of these changes and reveal their revised plan, which includes, as he says, a much better landing technique for Mars. So keep your ears open for that. So that's SpaceX's plan, which I mostly already knew about, because we all know I got a, a thing for the Musk. But NASA's got pretty detailed plans of their own, and it all revolves around their new crew vehicle, the Orion spacecraft. Now, I've gotta say, when I first heard about the Orion spacecraft, I was pretty disappointed in it, because I grew up with the space shuttle, you know? It was like a plane that landed on a runway, and that was really cool, and the idea of going back to another splashdown capsule just seemed like a step backwards to me. But the more I look at the Orion capsule, honestly, the more impressed I am with it. This thing is pretty friggin' cool. It's often called Apollo on steroids, which it is in every way. And it's taken a really long time to come together because it's designed to do a little bit of everything from shuttling astronauts up to the ISS to traveling all around the solar system. They're future-proofing the crap out of this thing. The ship is made of three parts, the multi-purpose crew vehicle, or MPCV, the service module, and the adapter module. The adapter module connects the Orion to the space launch system, which I'll cover in a minute, but it also allows it to connect to modular deep space habitats for longer deep space missions. The service module stores water and fuel and is propelled by the same engine that powered the space shuttle. 
It'll also have four solar panels that will spread about 62 feet or 19 meters when extended and generate 11 kilowatts of power, twice as much electricity as the Apollo service module. It's also 40% lighter, 12% smaller, but still able to support a crew of four for 21 days as opposed to Apollo's three-man crew for 14 days. But the crown jewel of Orion is the MPCV, capable of carrying six passengers and fitted with the newest technology, making it highly automated and fitted with touchscreen glass panels. It's covered with this low-Z material and state-of-the-art AATB8 tiles to protect against radiation from the Van Allen belts, as well as solar wind outside the Earth's magnetic sphere, not to mention micrometeoroids and space debris. For re-entry, it carries the largest heat shield ever constructed at 5 meters wide, but thanks to revolutionary honeycomb structure and EBCOAT technology, it's only 4 centimeters thick. And as it descends to Earth, it goes through three sets of parachutes to slow it down for a gentle splashdown. And all this will be carried into space by NASA's new Space Launch System, or SLS. The SLS looks like the space shuttle mated with a Saturn V, with two shuttle-era solid rocket boosters flanking a giant core stage fitted with four RS-25 engines, the same engines on the space shuttle. It'll be capable of lifting 70 metric tons of payload into orbit in the smallest configuration, the Block 1 version, with upgrades planned in the future to eventually reach 130 metric tons in a Block 2 cargo version. Now, if this sounds like they're reusing a lot of the shuttle technology, that's because they are. But that could be a good thing. There's something to be said for using tried and tested technology instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. As for how these vehicles will get us to Mars, NASA has a four-phase plan. A four-phase plan that actually involves us going back to the moon. Because there are two components that NASA wants to build in orbit around the moon, the Deep Space Gateway and the Deep Space Transport. The Deep Space Gateway is basically a lunar space station, a place to test deep space systems in an area close enough to return to Earth if needed. It's designed to support four astronauts for 42 days at a time and provide access to the moon for lunar landings. It's basically a way to use the moon to prepare for deep space missions. And the other component is the Deep Space Transport. This is a 41-ton spacecraft that includes a power system and habitation module that provides everything our astronauts would need for extended deep space missions. This is the actual craft that will take us to Mars and beyond. And NASA's timeline goes like this. Phase 1 begins in 2019 with Exploration Mission 1, or EM-1. This will send an unmanned Orion capsule into orbit around the Moon on top of the SLS. In 2022, we'll launch the Europa Clipper mission to the Jupiter system aboard the SLS. These are basically demonstration missions to prove the SLS safe before the first crewed Orion missions in 2023. In between shuttling astronauts to the ISS, the SLS and Orion will conduct missions EM-2, 3, and 4 between 2023 and 2025. These manned missions will build the Deep Space Gateway in orbit around the Moon. And then we close out Phase 1 with an airlock module on EM-5. Phase 2 begins in 2026 with EM-6, an unmanned mission which will launch the Deep Space Transport to the Moon. EM-7 will add a module to the DST, and the crew will spend around 200 days on board to test out the systems in 2027. EM-8 will add another logistics and refueling module in 2028, and in 2029, EM-9 will bring a crew to spend a full year on the Deep Space Transport. And finally, after one more mission adding a logistics module, Phase 3 will begin around 2033 with EM-11, which will bring a four-person crew to the Deep Space Transport and finally take it out of lunar orbit, beginning a 1,000-day mission that will fly around Venus and eventually to Mars. Wait a second. Apollo 11, EM-11... That's weird. And as for phase four, the part of the plan where we actually land on Mars, well, they don't really have any details on that. So after 11 missions over 14 years and hundreds of billions of dollars, we still don't actually land on Mars. This has drawn some criticism. Now clearly NASA is more concerned about the long-term effects of deep space travel, not only on the equipment, but on people as well, and they're being super cautious about that. So cautious we don't actually land on Mars. But in NASA's defense, they have actually landed on Mars. Several times. So maybe they're not as concerned about the landing part as they are about the getting there part. Plus they've got plenty of time to figure it out along the way. And the deep space transport isn't just about going to Mars, it's about setting up a long haul system to travel all over the solar system. Something that SpaceX has talked about in theory for the far future, but don't have any specific plans for. So those are our options. The fast, ambitious SpaceX plan to get us to Mars by the mid-20s, or the slow, prodding NASA plan to get us all over the solar system by the mid-30s. Which do you prefer? Keeping in mind that we might get both, or some combination of the two. SpaceX and NASA work together all the time. There's no reason to think they might not combine forces in some way in the future. Let me know what you think in the comments. 
All right, so for those of you who actually follow my channel, you know that I tend to get facts wrong a lot. It's part of my charm. I'm charming. But maybe you'd actually like to learn something from people who know what they're talking about, which is why I am thrilled to be partnering up with The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is an on-demand subscription service giving you access to a library of thousands of lectures from some of the smartest people alive today. I'm talking about lectures that open up your mind and answer questions you didn't even know you had from people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, Sean Carroll, and Richard Wilson. I actually just started watching a series by Dr. Stephen Gimbel called Redefining Reality, The Intellectual Implications of Modern Science. And it talks about how our understanding of science has changed our definition of reality. It goes into things like the Big Bang and quantum field theory, quantum consciousness, transhumanism, the implications of AI. I mean, come on, tell me that's not up my alley. I don't even want to finish this video, I just want to watch it now. But that's just the science section. They also have sections on history, travel, personal development, finances, health, language, basically anything you want to know about, they've got a whole course about it on The Great Courses Plus. And if you want to give it a try, you can get a free one month trial by going to The Great Courses Plus slash Answers with Joe, link down in the description. Maybe we could watch Redefining Reality together and talk about it on the Facebook page. That'd be fun. But actually, seriously, I, I'd heard about The Great Courses Plus in all kinds of other places, but I'd never actually checked it out until they reached out to me. And then I went over there and I looked, and it, and it is. It's, it's, it's amazing. It, it blew my mind. So if you are into this kind of thing, I, I definitely recommend checking it out. So thanks to The Great Courses Plus for supporting this channel. And while I'm at it, thanks to the Patreon supporters who help keep things going here. I want to call out some of the new people who just joined this week. We've got Brian Hargrove, Justin Shillington, Mason Petrosky, and Budjim Lambeth. I hope I said that right. Uh, thank you guys so much for, for supporting me. And if you would like to join them, join the party, get access to all kinds of bonus content and stuff you won't get anywhere else, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. All right, like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, uh, here's a video right there that YouTube thinks you might like. Take a look at that one. And if you like that, maybe subscribe because I come back with videos just like this every Monday. All right, thanks so much for watching. You guys go out and have an eye-opening week and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.